Hey everybody, I'm Adam. <laughs> so, I just found out that I'm supposed to give about a 30 minute talk. I only prepared for a five minute talk, so I'm gonna give 25 minutes about myself. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, for real. I, have been coming to the Austin API meetup on and off for five or six years. And it was actually a little over four years ago that I was sitting, not over there because it wasn't here, it was in a different location. It's much smaller and we had no nice food or drinks, but we still had good content. I was sitting there and I was watching Jason Harmon talk. Whoever was supposed to be presenting was, and, and the, our normal host was out sick. Jason was there and he did an impromptu presentation about how he was using Swagger at, uh, at PayPal. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. We looked at Swagger and my team said we couldn't use it. So after watching him use Swagger for an hour, I thought, I need to go back to my team and I need to say, hey, you know what? We can use Swagger. So I go back and they're like, no, we looked at it before. We couldn't use it. I was like, look at it again, please. <laughs> look at it again. And, and sure enough, it was like, oh, look, it's Swagger 2 is out. And we were looking at 1.2 before, um, so we can use it, Adam. And I thought, this is fantastic. So I got super psyched about it, and I said, let's, let's um, describe our whole API using it, and then let's fire up the Swagger UI and have our documentation automatically render from this API definition. So we do that. It took us like two weeks to descri describe our whole API. It was hundreds of operations. And we didn't know what we were doing as well. So we finally do that. We fire up Swagger UI. And I say, huh, we must have done something wrong because this, this is not how it normally looks. Like normally you, you can see what the request parameters are. And for when it was showing our requests, it was just showing that the re it takes a body. I'm like, yeah, they, the, the request does take a body. But what is in that body? <laughs> and so this led me to, to, to go down the path of eventually developing Redoc, which is uh, popular open source, open API documentation software. We built it for Rebilly, and uh, we, we open sourced it. We didn't really promote it. We didn't do much marketing, but it became very popular because a lot of people had that same exact problem that we had, sure enough. And today, it's used at approximately 80% of the global 500. And I thought, and ship engine too. So I thought, <laughs> global 501. 81%. Um, <laughs> the, um, and the, the thing that I found interesting when I started saying who's using this is a lot of these companies, I didn't even know that they have technology. It's like, you, you make furniture or you know, speakers or TVs. Oh, well, they, they all actually are using APIs, which is really fantastic. So I, I think 
this is something that maybe wasn't the case six years ago when I was sitting there here in the meetup. But now everyone's using APIs, and a lot of people are familiar with OpenAPI, which was formerly known as Swagger. So when I said Swagger from earlier, that's what, I'm, that's what I was talking about. So, and, and naturally, this, this uh, sitting in the audience has led me full circle to where I am today, having uh, spun off from Rebilly, a new company, Redockly, where we make a commercial version of our API documentation software. This talk is about docs when? When do you write the docs for an API? So I just want to do a, a poll, a show of hands here. Who, uh, no shame in this, who never writes the docs? So you got some APIs where you never, you never write any docs for them. Does anybody use them or are you the only user? Yeah, okay. What about last? Who, who writes the docs last? So pretty much after you. This is what we heard about earlier. This one case of so, something getting out there. Okay. So let's deploy it. Let's de get some users using it somehow, and then let's, let's get the docs going. Who does it in parallel? So we think, you know what? We're going to, uh, we're going to develop and write the docs at the same time. So. Okay, we got some people somewhere. Who writes the docs first? Like nobody, right? So since I've been in this arena for a little while and I get to talk to a lot of interesting characters, I find it's, it's pretty interesting, but maybe it's about 5% of the people who write the docs first. And I'm not talking about um, the published novel. I'm talking about the rough draft, <laughs> right? The rough draft version. So usually when, and I have the privilege of working with uh, about 50 different developers, and uh, many times there's the, that developer who's you know, when do you write the doc? Never. So um, I, I have this thing, the smell test, to see, like, is this, is this actually viable? Uh, so this is my smell test. See, like, if, when should you write the docs? Never. It might be, a, it might be possible. So here we go. Now, I know a toilet is not an API, but it is an interface. So <laughs> look, mom, no docs. Right? We all can use it here, I think. So is it intuitive? Is it discoverable? And is it ubiquitous? Maybe not the talk you thought you were going to get tonight, but I'm going with it anyway. So, and it may seem this way on the surface, but you know what? Toilet's not really ubiquitous. Depends on where you live in the world. So if you're living somewhere where toilets are relatively new or you're installing a toilet where you may have visitors from people who live somewhere where toilets are relatively new, then you might need some docs, even though they're pretty small and basic. It can be helpful. So when it comes to my API, look, mom, no docs. You know, she's not happy. APIs are not intuitive. I know you use the term that your endpoint names are intuitive, but they're still not really that intuitive. Nobody would guess them. I mean, maybe they could guess a few of them. They're not, so in that case, they're not necessarily discoverable either. And they're definitely not ubiquitous. Everybody's API is different. So, Using the process of elimination, which I use in my life, you know, you gotta, you've been voted off the island. You gotta leave. Never. 
Okay, so let's take a look at last. Should we, should we write the docs after we've finished developing the API? At least hopefully then we only need to write them once. All right, look mom, it's okay. We'll write them last. Oh, okay. And this is a really beautiful picture, so I was, I was thinking, this, is, this, this looks really good. Let's put all the developers in a nice barn. They'll do their work. And then after that, you know, they'll take a nap, and they'll, they'll place these API docs at the top of this thing. What is this thing? It's a silo. <laughs> and out comes this beautiful documentation. Well, there's some problems with this approach. It actually creates some internal silos. It leads to increased rework, which you alluded to in that one case, and it could lead to decreased usage. So most people are writing APIs because they want someone to use them, or, and it will create business value. All of this, writing the docs last, can, can lead to increased team tension. And it's not fun to work in a tense environment. So using the process of elimination, I've crossed that one off the list. Next, parallel. All right, docs parallel. Hmm, here I'm trying to draw a parallel between something, a wireframe, and the rough draft of your docs. Would you wireframe before, parallel, or after you build a user interface? In parallel, of course, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, before. So we, we wireframe first. The wireframe is the equivalent of the very rough draft of the docs. So we don't want to do this in parallel, actually. Maybe we want to, if we want to make a more parallel um, comparison, maybe we want to refine the wireframes and go from low fidelity to high fidelity in, in parallel. But we want to start with something low fidelity first. So, now that we're, we picked our winner, what is the goal of this? Why write the docs first? We want to have and encourage better teamwork. This is not just among developers, but among all departments. You can involve even marketing in writing the docs. Less, that's, yes, I'm talking to you, Brad. <laughs> Less rework, right? We want to prevent rework. It's, it's faster to rewrite a paragraph than it is to rewrite a module. Increase usage. We want people to use our APIs. I mean, nobody wants to build something that gets thrown away consistently. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay, but if you get to throw away your own stuff, it feels good, but when someone else is throwing away your stuff, it doesn't. We want to reduce support and questions. This is a common uh, objective, and this approach allows us to do this because we're approaching it with more empathy for the user who in this case is the, the developer who's consuming our API. And we want to reduce the time to usage. So we don't want someone to have to spend six months figuring out how to use our API. They probably won't have the persistence to do it anyway. So we want a, a quick start. So how? So I say, yeah, I'm gonna do this first, but I still have no docs. What am I going to do? How do I get started? So for, 
the thing that I like to start with is, is the foundational principles or, or my philosophy. First is take an approach of docs like code. Has anybody heard of that phrase? Yeah? All right, so it seems like it's about 50-50 split. So it is basically about treating your documentation just like you would treat your code. Checking it in to, uh, or using version control uh, or source uh, control. In our case, we like to use Git and like GitHub. Um, we uh, SSOT. This I saw this acronym for the first time just a couple weeks ago, and I was like, "What is this? Why? Why is this acronym here?" I uh, it took me a while to figure out. Single source of truth. I say that phrase all the time, <laughs> and someone had someone had uh, abbreviated it. I was like, "Ah, oh, okay." That's much easier for me to type out. SSOT. SOT. Okay. So, single source of truth. I like to um, uh, the dry principle, which is don't repeat yourself. But as it applies to documentation, is if you're an APIs, if you're going to define an API, you you write your API description or definition. You don't want to then write contextual documentation that repeats parts of that definition because you have the, the likelihood that in the future those will diverge and you'll have um, documentation that is no longer consistent with your API definition. So to keep those um, together, stick with a single source of truth. If you write an API definition, use it to power your contextual documentation. And focus on the business problem. So make sure your API is solving something. So, <laughs> what is a docs skeleton? So I start out with a skeleton. This is how I get started faster. I'm going to show you something in a couple minutes that I put together in about two hours. And a lot of the reason I'm able to do that, not that it's exceptionally fast, is because I'm starting, I'm not starting from scratch. I'm starting from a skeleton. Skeleton, my skeleton is a self-contained portal that enables an internal team to collaborate using the familiar docs-like code. We get instant feedback on API definition mistakes. My workflow is author, validate, commit, and push. We use the GitHub flow, which is a branch, create a PR, commit, create a PR, peer review, Merge. We can run the docs in our local environment. I'm going to give you a walkthrough of the work workflow, if I can see my screen. Ooh, tiny. I'll blow it up. So earlier, I was thinking about, you know, I've, uh, what company should I start next? <laughs> and I thought, you know, there's this problem with uh, anti-money laundering compliance. You need to know your customer. And it's uh, really tedious and painful to do that. Uh, a lot of times you're sending documents back and forth, and uh, the first time you send the document might not be appropriate. Uh, you, you might have missed something, and it can take days or a week to, to get the documents in to, to know your customer. But there's got to be some tools that automate that, and I found some. There's a couple that are really expensive, 
And there's um, uh, a couple that just have little little pieces of a solution. I thought, you know what, this would be a great example for an API because I found a problem that's bothering me, and I want to solve it, and I want to do it by creating an API. So I start by spinning up a my portal, which is this uh, Redockly uh, software that we've uh, created, and the the portal is. Uh, is generating, and this is my local host. So I've got this uh, running on my, well, I think it's running. If you can see that, it is. So I've, um, I've started by just stating the problem. What's the problem here? What do, what do we need? Like, we need, Save money, increase user conversions, because users are dropping off as they're. You're, if you're, if you are in a regulated industry where your customers need to um, uh, provide some sort of uh, documentation to prove who they are to do business with you, they're dropping off right now. So we need to reduce that friction, increase user conversions, protect your data privacy. All of the tools I saw out there are cloud-based tools. What companies want to send their data across the cloud to a third party to do this type of service? All of the products out there are doing that right now. Save time and costs, it's really costly. People are ma manually reviewing these things and meet Compliance mandates. That's the main thing, right? Stay out of stay out of prison. So, at least at least for me, that's what I'm trying to do. So I know we all have different different things, but that's mine. So, zoom in a little bit. So the the um, what I what I did was I borrowed a couple people. Yeah, anti-money laundering. Yeah, the KYC is know your customer. Yeah, AML is the one of the main law, one of the main reasons you need to to do that in certain industries like banking. But it's not just banking, like vaping. They'll they'll need to know their customers. They need to verify. They need to do age verification, or they should. Um, so, started off by looking at the pain and just using some, some markdown, uh, which is comfortable for us. I've formulated this page and another page and I formulated the, the left nav and I borrowed a, um, our, my customer av avatar this is Lou. He's the money laundering um, regulatory officer at a company. And he's very meticulous, process oriented, and rule bound. He's not easy going. And he's not getting along very well with sales and marketing because they feel like he's slowing them down. Yeah, he's eating into their commissions. So. I started to think about the use cases. So this, this kind of was coming in from, from uh, marketing, looking at the market size. Apparently it's a $750 million a year industry and growing. And then digging into some of the use cases, specifically gather and analyze documents. And in this case, what I did was We've integrated into the, the portal uh, Mermaid JS. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Mermaid JS, but this allows you to write in Markdown like a code snippet, where in Markdown you usually use the little three hash marks, and then you can put the language that you want to type in, like JS, right? And then it'll get, you get code highlighting for JavaScript. 
Uh, if you put three hash marks and you write mermaid, in our case because we've integrated it, now I can write a specific syntax for mermaid, and in this case, I made a sequence diagram. I don't know if it's any good, but <laughs> this is my vision of the sequence for uh, your app, how your customer would be integrated between your app, your customer, and recomply now, this product. So then I also um, had the luxury of being able to bug my uh, product designer and said, hey, I need a couple wireframes. It's this customer journey where someone's going to uh, request their ID, right? And they're either gonna, if they're on a mobile phone, they could take a picture or upload an image. Um, and they, then they'll be able to verify, they'll see a preview of it, then they'll verify it. Then if it doesn't, if they upload something bad, Right, we analyze it, then we give them some, some pointers about how to make it better, like if it was cut off or blurry or something like that. Then when they do, do it again and they do it right, we give them this thank you, and they continue on back to where they were in their, in their journey. And then this, this product would also need to have some sort of ongoing alerts. That's another use case is, oh, this, this person is still my customer, and I need to make sure they're not in the sanctions list, right? This person hasn't, you know, bombed someone, bombed one of our allies. So <laughs> we need to make sure they're not in the sanctions list. Well, we have to do that by law, or else we might go to prison. And we need verification that we've done that. So we can now monitor just by subscribing to some webhook. Say, hey, here's my customer list, I wanna to subscribe to that. And since Lou is, is very uh, rigid in his ways, he'll still be able to do the manual reviews if he wants to, but he'll have a nicer workbench for doing that. And here we pull in the corresponding APIs, uh, use Open API to to describe so some of the APIs that I thought we would need, like creating a customer. And I I thought our response back might have some uh, some read only parameters, like like if if uh, their KYC document status, um, if they're in the sanctions list or in the PEP list, PEP. Another acronym is politically exposed person. So some industries you also have to report if you're doing business with a politician or a relative of a politician. Uh, it's just part of, part of doing business. And then I thought of, for the document analysis, how would this work? Well, we need, we need to be able to create a file, right? So someone, needs to be able to create a file. Maybe they'll be doing it from, uh, uh, from inline as I had shown in that app, but maybe, maybe from, a, from a URL. So use this feature, one of, uh, if, if you're not familiar with in, in uh, OpenAPI schema, you can, uh, you, you can use certain uh, uh, certain relationships from uh, JSON schema, like one of, any of, all of. So one of allows us to have two possible request bodies for this API, because the file might come from a URL, or we might just send up the, the base64 encoded raw data. And then we need to create the document itself. So we need that we need that file, the customer, and the doc type of document that we're uploading. Is this a proof of identity, or is it a proof of address, or, or what? I didn't think this through fully, but this uh, it gives us a much better idea of 
before we start actually building this, is this even what we want to build? Is this the right thing? And is it from a user's perspective, would they even be able to use this thing? I don't know. I mean, I think it needs to be refined for sure. It's incomplete. But because I leveraged the skeleton, the portal, and I have decent knowledge of open API, so I don't struggle with API definitions, uh, I was able to put this together in uh, about two hours. So with mm, the designer. I, I have zero design skills. So, um, but it, it just, the, the most common reason I get as to why we don't write the docs first is we don't have time to do that. We don't have the time to do that. And it seems like that's, that's valid because uh, depending on where you're at in your journey, when I was back, back here, like, I want to do that, but I don't know where to start is, is where I was at back here. I wanted to do that, but I didn't know where to start. And at the same time, it involves leaving your normal comfort zone because you have to go and get the technical documentation writer and someone from marketing, Brad. Right, we would just get Brad, and you know maybe a designer, uh, and you need to pull them all together, and you're doing something new that you haven't done before, which is kind of create a product before you really know what you're creating, and so I think the number one reason why people don't do this is because of that. Um, discomfort or unfamiliar uh, feeling. If you, once you've done it three times, you'll be much better at it. No promise on the first two. The, the thing I'd, I'd um, the other thing that I'd really recommend is looking back at at this slide, look at this wireframe with Comic Sans. It's a disgrace, and to to designers, right? It's a disgrace. To des it looks great to me, though. But um, <laughs> the a designer, they you know, I could give a designer a heart attack by by showing them this and telling them seriously, this is what I want to build, and. Um, the, I could probably do the same thing with a, the with a documentarian, right? Because we, we want to start out as, it's a, it's a really rough draft. It's a wireframe. We, we have to understand that this is going to be very far from perfect. And we need the documentarian to, um, you know, to be okay with putting out below um, publishable quality, knowing that this is going to be used internally at first, and that as the project evolves, it's going to continually, they'll need to continually improve and revise and make it polished and perfect, or as, nothing's perfect, but as close to perfect as possible. So that's the, um, that's another challenge that you might have to, overcome as you, as you pursue this, uh, this route or this journey. Uh, and uh, any thoughts or questions?